My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 125 of Legally Clueless. I'm super excited for this episode because we're going to be sharing one of the stories that we recorded on day one of the Legally Clueless tour. And I'm just happy that it's finally happening and you get to listen in to some of the stories and I can share some of the experiences so far. But before we get to that, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, remember that you can join us on our Instagram page, which is at Legally Clueless Podcast. There's a link to it in the show notes. If you want to chit chat about the podcast on Twitter, please use the hashtag Legally Clueless. I can find you and thank you for being part of the tribe. And what else do I need to say? I've forgotten what else. Oh, I have remembered what else I want you to check out. We do have season one of our video series out on our YouTube channel. A link to that is in the show notes, or you can just get onto YouTube and search Legally Clueless and watch 13 powerful episodes of different Africans just sharing some dope stories. Okay, so in a bit, you will hear a story we recorded on day one of the Legally Clueless tour of day one and two have been in Nairobi. And... It's the city I live in, have grown up in. So I felt like this is where we should flag off the tour. Listen to this. So I meet this guy and he sweeps me off my feet. So I give him the chance we date for almost four years. He would really go through my phone and he would try to ask every detail of every guy's number I had on my phone. So who is this? And the funny thing, sometimes I would even go visit him at his place and he would disappear. He'd call me and say, I'm coming. I've just left work. But it gets to 11. He's not there. You call, he's not picking up. I got to a point I was pregnant and I found out he was cheating with a close friend who we were with in campus. They were even planning to get married. I had just gotten my first job and my periods are gone. (laughs) So, of course, I had to tell him. When I called, the first thing was that pregnancy isn't mine. We flew back from Mombasa. I remember we went, of course, straight to his house. When I got there, I found a bag with clothes. And I asked him, this seems like ladies' clothes. What are they doing here? This is a story by Julia that is absolutely amazing. She applied to share her story as part of the Legally Clueless tour. And I didn't realize we actually belong to a community of African female podcasters together. So yeah, it really did just work out really well. I can't wait for you to hear the entire story. It's coming up a little later in this episode. All right, so as you've guessed, there's going to be a lot of tour talk (laughs) in this episode. And this is because we hit off day one on Friday. I'm recording this actually on like Sunday night and I probably will not be done until hours before I publish it on Monday. (laughs) And the reason is I've just been so swamped with this tour. I think I really underestimated how much work there is when the tour starts. I focus so much on how much work goes into the before. I forgot the actual shooting days and all that can really just get hectic. So Friday, we had day one of the tour. We flagged off at Barraza Media Lab and what we did was just from 9 a.m. to like 7 p.m. record a bunch of storytellers. Such amazing, powerful, insightful, sometimes humorous stories that of course you will be hearing starting this episode and in the next following months actually. So that day was really awesome. I'm working with such an amazing team. So we're not only recording audio episodes, there's going to be some amazing video episodes as well. So today, the reason I'm recording this so late, actually from yesterday, Saturday into today, Sunday, we were recording the video episodes. It has been so amazing. (laughs) Like, I cannot wait for us to hit the road next Sunday because if Nairobi was this good, can you imagine the counties we're going to that I haven't been in very often? Ah, It's got to be bananas. So I'm really excited about the tour. Our next stop is going to be Kisubu. So that's super awesome. I cannot wait for that. So before we get to the story, just a heads up, I have no song of the week. (laughs) You know, I'm so intentional with the music that I share with you that I just didn't want to half-ass it. And I genuinely just have had such a hectic last three days that it's it's been difficult to even listen just to the songs that I already love, honestly. Just bear with me. No song of the week this week, but I'm hoping next week 
I will have a song to share with you that you will add onto your playlist. So before we jump into 100 African stories, there's something else that I wanted to share that has absolutely nothing to do with the tour. I do not even know why I'm sharing it in this episode, but it just occurred to me this past week into the weekend, maybe because July is ending, new month, and I was reflecting of, okay, so what has my business side of things? What have we managed to do in July? What do we need to step up? What do we need to keep doing, etc., etc.? Who do we need to keep calling to pay us our money? <laughs> and other tales. Hey, anyway, it occurred to me that July has been very kind to me. And I'm sharing this caveat. This is not gloating. This is two things. This is one, sitting in your wins, which I don't think we do enough of. I think we're constantly chasing a high that two things happen. We don't sit in our wins and just accept like, wow, we really did achieve that. Like how badass are we? Self high five. And two, what happens is we miss the moments in between the highs where a lot of life happens because we're just constantly chasing the next high. So I'm practicing sitting in my wins. The other reason that I'm sharing this is just I have really seen how intentionality has helped my business and just my, not only my business, honestly, just even like my personal growth as much as the context here is business. So what happens is every beginning of the year, I will set goals for what I want to achieve business-wise and try and strategize around it, but also remain pretty open-minded because Lord knows anything can happen (laughs) and plans will have to change. And I remember this year because of all of the shit I've gone through with a lot of local agencies. I've talked about this in previous (laughs) previous episodes. I mean, there are are some who have been so amazing to me, but there are quite a few. There's a problem, basically, is what I'm trying to say in how they engage with you, in their terms, in ethics. <laughs> So at the beginning of the year, what I did was kind of like describe what my ideal partners would look like. What are their beliefs? What are their values vis-a-vis mine? And then what I did was actually look around and see, are there actual organizations like this? What are their names? (laughs) Who are they? And I remember I did a couple of pitches to some and others reached out. So let me start with the good news (laughs) because we're sitting in our wins, right? So I think one of my dream partners, which is a global company. So when I was writing this stuff down, most of the names I came up with were global companies who some of them have a local presence. Anyway, so after writing them down, I pitched to a few and some actually like this I'm not even like shitting you some who I may not have named them but they as per the description I had matched that actually ended up reaching out I can't explain it but maybe sometimes if you write down something and you proclaim it because I would tell Fal this all the time you then start being more conscious about working towards that thing maybe it's that I do not know anyway so an ideal partner reached out had a fantastic partnership it was so easy where like I can't explain like if you and whoever you're partnering with share the same values and it it just makes things so much easier you know so it was a fantastic process and then another one again I had not written this one down by name but they by the description matched the type of companies I was looking to partner with reached out and it felt good you know I was like oh my god this is possible I can do this that's the wins I also lost (laughs) I lost a couple yeah I think one didn't feel so good that I didn't even make any progress like after pitching it was just they didn't get back to me and I really worked so hard on that pitch I don't know maybe we're just not meant to work together it was not aligned so that one didn't feel so good I was like damn it I really wanted this guys what the hell so that didn't feel good and then I I lost I think about two pitches well not lost but like you get they didn't materialize to anything. But what I did learn is I'm getting much better in handling business rejection. One, because I'm just growing up. Like, (laughs) I, I feel like being in business is really good when it comes to maturing you real quick. So I am growing up. And secondly, I just think also there is no time to mope 
around. So you pitch today, they haven't got back. Tomorrow you still have like reports to do. You still have production work to do. You still have to coordinate stuff. So there's no time to like mope around about kind of like being rejected. I don't know if that's a healthy thing. (laughs) I feel like you need to make time to actually feel emotions, but not like overextend in that space but I'm just saying where I'm at right now is just that there's just no time anyway I just wanted to share that because sometimes we just get so caught up in chasing the highs and we don't sit in the highs long enough to actually take it in and be like you did that like you actually you did that you (laughs) do you not understand how dope you are you did that and then I think there's quite a lot of magic in the moments in between the highs and the lows like the average life moments there's so much everyday magic it could be like on Saturday I was at an art exhibition and I saw the most beautiful butterfly like I'm not even kidding you it was it was so and it was like my colors yellows oranges and and I actually was like lost in it for a couple of minutes which I was like yeah like we just miss out on a lot of magic in the in-between moments and I just would want this to be a wake-up call for you to not keep doing that all right I have rumbled on for far too long um (laughs) do not know why I am singing that but let's jump in to 100 African stories y'all this is The first story we're sharing from our ongoing Legally Clueless tour. So it's kind of a big deal coming from Nairobi. And it's an interesting story around relationships, dating while being a single mom. And it's a story by Julia, who's a digital marketer and podcaster as well, based right here in Kenya. A hundred African stories on Legally Clueless coming to you from the road. We partnered with African No Filter to take this podcast on tour to Nakuru, Kisumu, Mombasa, and Nairobi, bringing you powerful and inspiring African stories. So my name is Julia Awar. I'm a digital marketer by profession and a podcaster. My podcast goes by the name Just Being Real, Good Vibes Only Podcast. And um, I'm from Kenya, Nairobi. So basically, I was in campus trying to juggle through campus, learning, and you meet the person you think is the love of your life. So that was my um, major, major relationship, like longest relationship that I've ever been. And he's the father to my baby because I'm a single parent. Let me call it that. Um, My child is eight years old. Um, He's he's a boy. So it started off with a heartbreak first because I just gotten through with high school and I've met, okay, people are having boyfriends and everything and you're thinking, oh, I should try this out. My dad was the most, okay, let me say he was an educationist. So he never tolerated anyone having a boyfriend. So that was a no-go zone all through my <laughs> primary and high school life. But I would see my friend do it. <laughs> so I, I, I was so curious. So by the time I got done with High school, that was the first thing I wanted to try out. So I met this guy and he sweeps me off my feet. But I think it lasted for only five months because I was called in for to join campus. And when I joined campus, he vermoosed. Reason why I think he vermoosed was because I think he thought now I've joined campus, he was not uh, going to school himself. He hadn't gone to college or done anything because his mother was not capable of doing it. So I think when he saw me joining campus, he thought this was the end of our relationship because now I'm going to meet other people and everything. So he went mute. So I'm here nursing my first breakup and uh, this guy comes in. And of course, the first thing I tell him is I can do this now. I'm still getting over what happened. And the one thing I think I gave it to him was he gave me time to just get through it. I gave him a hard time (laughs) before I decided, okay, let's do this. But I think by the time I was giving him a chance, it was because he had decided to wait and his patience. I didn't really look much into, do we connect? Are we conversing? Are we at the same page or whatever? It was just, oh, you waited for this long and you're not giving up, so okay, let's do this. So I gave him the chance. We did for almost four years. He was two years ahead of me in campus. So of course he finished campus earlier. He'd gotten lucky because he got a job before he finished campus. So by the time he got out, he was so established and now money was coming in. He decided, let me uh, do my masters. Again, money was, you know, doubled plus he got promoted. And now 
I don't know, let's call it pride came in and it was crazy. It started with a lot of cheating. Uh, we couldn't communicate at all. So it was a roller coaster. It was that relationship where you're just in a roller coaster, but you're like, you know what? I've realized women, we try to fix things. Like, you know, he'll change. Maybe she'll try talking to him or let me give him time or whatever. So of course you're waiting for this person to change, but it's not happening. It's one woman to another. Every other time you're getting a text, it's a call. And then the one thing, the red flag that was there was he would really go through my phone and he would try to ask like every detail of every guy's number I had on my phone. So who is this? If a guy calls me, even if it's a classmate, I have to explain who they are. And with time I realized he was doing this because he knew what he was doing behind the scenes. So he thought I was doing the same thing, which wasn't the case. But you know what? We held on, forged on, we were on and off. And the funny thing, sometimes I would even go visit him at his place and he would disappear. He'd call me and say, I'm coming, I'm just, I've just left work. But it gets to 11, he's not there. You call, he's not picking up. He'll come back the following day at around 6 p.m. When you try a question, he walks off. So he walks off, he'll go. So you wait for him there and you're feeling guilty. You're like, oh, I shouldn't have asked. Maybe it's my fault. And then when he comes back, you don't want to question because again, you don't want him to walk off. So you end up piling, piling every single issue. And I guess it got to a point and it just blew off. And now here I got to a point I was pregnant and I found out he was cheating with a f close friend who we were with in campus and they were even planning to get married. Ha! Huh. So the day I found that I was pregnant, wow, I remember I had just gotten my first job and my periods are gone. <laughs> but in my head, I was like, no, I can't be pregnant. There's, there's just no way. There's just no way. And I remember it was end of December, and we were going to New Year. That was in 2012, so jumping to 2013. I remember that day, everyone was like, ah, Julia, let's go. You know, have fun. You know it's. <laughs> I was like, no, I want to go home. So I decided, let me uh, pass by a chemist, get the kit, and go home. So I passed by the chemist, by the kit, and I go home and I do the test. I, I remember I wasn't even worried. I was so sure it's nothing. And I had no symptoms making it worse. I did have morning sickness, nothing. So that made me believe I wasn't, though my periods were not there. <laughs> so I got home and I'm, I put, I remember I just put the test and I looked at it. I didn't even hide it. Like, let me hide it and you know, I don't want to see. I put it there and I was like, I saw it. I like, I saw the two lines forming and I was just looking at it. Like I couldn't believe it. I remember the first thing was, I was in shock. I didn't cry. I didn't do anything. I got to into bed, slept. I remember just uh, being woken up to one, two, three, <laughs> guys counting down to now the new year. And I was like, okay, let me just sleep. So in the morning, that's when it hit me. But I was still like, no, this is not happening. I had bought the 50 shillings kit and I was like, maybe that's faulty. Maybe I should buy the 200 one. So I went back, <laughs> bought a 200 bob kit and came back. Again, looked at it, it formed the two lines. And I was like, okay. Again, I was like, no. So I went back, I went to a hospital. And I was like, you know what? It's funny because I, I know people have symptoms when they're pregnant, but I'm not having symptoms, but these kids are saying I have, I, I'm pregnant and I don't believe it. And the doctor was shocked. So you want to redo the test because you're not believing the kid? I'm like, yes, I want to. And he did the test again and yeah, it was, I just had to believe it. So of course I had to tell him. And when I called, the first thing was that pregnancy isn't mine. And uh, wow, I didn't expect that <laughs> because I hadn't been with anyone. Though in the process of us being up and down, there was someone who was always there, you know, those slacking men who were always there, like, you know, Julia got you. But you know, it wasn't something serious, but I had thought of it. So I guess him knowing that there was this person, he thought I was cheating, which wasn't the case. So he didn't believe it. And at some point, of course, it, he wanted me to get rid of the baby. And it's something that came through my mind because I was like, okay, I've just gotten a new job. I'm just getting to enjoy my first salary for heaven's sake. <laughs> you know, you send um, applications and applications and you're not getting jobs. And now here I've gotten the first job and this is the first thing that comes and I have nothing. So it was really hard. So I actually, I contemplated doing an abortion and I even found out 
where I could get such a service. And I remember when I decided to go, I think I went three times. And every time I would go, sit, when it was my turn, I would walk away. And the worst thing I did was I used to drink like crazy. So there was an option of me getting rid of the baby or drink myself and the baby comes out and, and then I'll say, it, 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 it ain't my fault. It's, it just happened. Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately? Let me say fortunately. The, I, I was able to keep the baby after it all, I, uh, after just thinking through and deciding, okay, let me just do it because I'm here, I'm 26 years old. I have my own house, though it's a bed sitter with only a mattress and no meko or anything and a baby coming in nine months and I didn't know what to do, but I was like, okay, we'll just do this. We'll just figure out things as they go. So for him, when I decided I'm keeping the baby, um, he decided he wouldn't be part of it. Okay, he told me he didn't have a job and he wouldn't be able to sustain me, which was a lie, came to find out later, but I made it through alone. Though, during my delivery, I had a complication. I had a cervical tear and I lost a lot of blood and I'm O negative and the hospital I was in did not have blood. Um, so I had to be transferred to Kenyatta, which was hectic. And there was no one else who would do it. So I called him and told him, you have to come. You have to come through. So he came through, he helped through everything, which at that time was amazing. So during paying bills, he was nowhere to be seen. <laughs> so I had to take a loan to pay my hospital bill because now everything just, everything just skyrocketed. I decided uh, I'll just do it alone. At that time, when I'm going through this, he's already married to someone else. They got married in like two months after I found out. So when I found out he was cheating, I didn't know I was pregnant. And I was, I was living with my sister. I had gone for, I had gotten a small assignment in Mombasa. So I'd gone there. And then he told me he'll come for me there, which he did. And then when we came back, we flew back from Mombasa. I remember we went, of course, straight to his house. And when I got there, I found a bag with clothes. And I asked him, this seems like ladies' clothes. What are they doing here? And who do they belong to? He's like, you know, it's, uh, now I know her name. Let me say Grace. It's Grace. She did have somewhere to put her clothes because she had gotten done with her masters. So she brought them here. <laughs> Does it make sense? But all right. So of course that made me curious. By that time, something I haven't said, he had a baby mama before they got a baby earlier on. So he had a child and the child would come through sometimes and stay over. And the, so when the child comes through, there was a nanny. So the nanny was there because the child was around. So when I tried to ask, the nanny said, yeah, uh, the lady was here. She stayed for a couple of days actually. I'm like, okay. So that's when I decided, okay. I didn't even tell him. I think I just, cause I knew every other time he cheated, we would talk about it. He would apologize or get mad and storm off. So there was nothing sorted out. So this time I was done. I was like, no, I can't do this. I just went back to my sister, decided enough is enough. And by that time I came to realize he was planning a wedding and now here I am at some point realizing again I'm pregnant. So yeah, we had to figure things out. And at that time I also had, you know, I was staying with my sister and I was thinking, okay, if I tell my sister I'm pregnant and I'm under her roof, a problem so went back to looking for a house and I got a bed sitter and I remember I didn't even have that mattress I didn't even have that mattress so I had to figure things out and now I got a job luckily then that month I don't know if there's a way when you just move out things open up <laughs> so that's what happened so of course I will go through my pregnancy my complication and I'm able to get through it, and now I'm back home. One of the things that really makes me sad is because my dad was pissed. By the time I was getting done with campus, we had planned I'll proceed and do my master's. But now when I got done with campus, I thought, why should I proceed doing a master's without really knowing what the job market wants? So I convinced my dad, told him, let me go do something, you know, get employed. And then with that, I'll be able to know what I can master on. And he accepted and now he am pregnant. So of course he was disappointed, which was sad and it hit him hard. One of the things I feel sad is because he passed on without us ever reconciling when it comes to that. So here I am and I'm trying to focus on having a job, my first job, juggling life, a pregnancy, trying to save. The money is not enough and it was hard and him not being there because all through the pregnancy I handled it 
alone. So I give birth. I have a loan that I used to pay my hospital bill because we didn't have a medical cover. It's tough. You need a nanny. You need to eat. It's a totally new venture. It's crazy. So it was hard adjusting, but with time, of course, I did. And But thankfully, when I got into my first job, before I... Of course, I finished campus in 2011. So 2011 to 2012, I was really doing a lot of volunteer work. So when I went for my first interview, the CEO for that job was in my interview, like uh, the panel, and he went through my CV, I had written everything, I've volunteered, uh, you know, and he loved that. Within a month, he pushed for me and to, uh, I, was to, I was promoted to a supervisor. So that meant getting a raise which was hectic because now people started talking and you know they're like oh whites love small girls so that something happened and everything so you're trying to you know balance all these things they're so new they're so you know and it's so unfair and you're getting pissed when people tell you that but at the end of the day you just have to balance and again after three months i was promoted to a manager a customer service manager so that really helped the money came through for me and I was able to juggle through. When it comes to now dating, <laughs> of course everyone wants to be loved and they want to love back. But I remember by the time I was getting done with this and now trying to juggle through life, motherhood, career and stuff, I just didn't want to see any male figure at that time. <laughs> so it took me a while, like almost two years. And I decided, let me take my time off. And plus, I, I think at that time you're thinking, I don't want to be selfish, I want to give my child, you know, my full attention. Plus you have a lot going on. You don't want to add any more to your plate. It took me a while and then now I was ready. And I'm like, now Julia, here we are. We want to date. And there's no one. <laughs> there's just no one. Now, you see, you've gone through all this. So the people you meet, you want to see someone who brings value to your life. You, you're hard-headed, you are, you've done everything. Like, I can fix a bulb in my house, I can fix anything in my house. And if a man comes through and they can't do anything, I'm wondering, okay, what's, what's the use? What's the need? <laughs> so I guess by the time I was starting out, my friends were telling me I'm, I'm being too hard. And I guess I'd built a wall. And if at all I would see any red flag that I'd seen previously, I would just run off. But let me tell you, by the time I decided I'm dating, the dating scene is different. Whew. In this era, people don't date. It's, when are you coming to my house? When can I come to your house and you cook for me? I'm the traditional one. I want to be taken for coffee. Even if it's not uh, something that uh, needs financial kind of muscle, just take me for a walk or that the places that you know that you can go for picnic that is not happening i'm like what's going on and sometimes you'll meet someone and they'll start texting you and then um they're like oh so are you looking for something serious so you ask of course i ask questions and then they're like oh you want something serious i'm i'm not looking for that i'm just looking for a fling i'm like how do you even tell someone when it comes to meeting people i haven't tried dating apps it's something I'm planning to do maybe now, but I'm told it has weirdos, so I don't know. <laughs> when I was meeting people, it's either through friends, maybe you've been, you're invited somewhere, and then you meet people, and then they're like, oh, help me with her number or something. Or even friends pushing it, like, Julia, you have to go for a blind date. And, oh, social media, we've tried it. <laughs> eh, social media is a scam. So there's a time I decided, okay, you know, when you're, single of course on my page i put out i have a child and everything and of course there are those men who who are just camping on your inbox hi hey how are you so there's this guy who had contacted me for a whole freaking year and he, he would come hi i hope you had a lovely night and then during the day hi hope you you've had lunch and i'm not replying and then in the evening hi um i'm wishing you a good night so at some point i was like no julia i can just try <laughs> Just reach out. So one day I just wrote him hi. He was so excited. <laughs> and he was like, the first thing he asked, can I please have your number? I've really tried reaching out and you've never even said hi. And today I'm just thankful that you even said hi. So I decided, okay, I gave him my number. Again, after giving him my number, I think I ghosted him for like six months. But again, I was like, I'm, too, I'm being too hard. So I've, we eventually met. We dated for a while, let me tell you. For a while. And here, I got to a point, I'm like, I found my match. Here, if he proposes tomorrow, I'm done. And I remember there's a time he took me for a holiday. Um, it was my birthday. And we went to Mombasa. And 
my friends messed up my mind because they were like, you know what? I think he's going to propose. So all along the trip, I was like, oh, okay. So if I'm drinking wine, I'm checking. Is there a <laughs> And he went overboard because at some point on my birthday, not the night of my birthday, he actually had, had organized for a dinner date just along the ocean just and there was a cake and there were people singing and i'm like oh my god this is it this guy <laughs> he's just doing everything and that was the kind of guy who we would go out most of the time indoors who'd be like oh by the way i'm really bored at work i'm tired i just want a break can we meet for coffee at java somewhere and we'd go sit down and chat and chat even to 1 a.m but now the problem was he'd always be like you know i stay with my sister and i was like oh okay and my sister is going through a lot he's just separated from the husband so i'm giving her space so i'm like oh that's the reason why i can't come to your home yeah okay he's a good guy so i'm like he can't lie <laughs> and Oh my god, I remember we stayed for almost one year. And on this one fine day, on Valentine's Day, I get a phone call. He had told me he had traveled, but he would be back. So he was coming the following day, so I was getting ready, you know. I have boys coming. And I get a call. Um, this is so-and-so, and this is the wife to so-and-so. I just went blank. I cried. As in, that was, I felt like the world is crumbling, is ending. <laughs> So that was the craziest thing that happened when it comes to dating on social media. I avoid, like a plague. But now, unfortunately, again, when you date, when you're a mother, <laughs> who can be hard. So basically, for most people, I would tell them on the date. On the first date, because that's always been what I do. I'll tell them I have a child. And they'll be like, oh, okay, ah, kids are awesome, don't worry, I have no problem, okay. So you have this date and it's going well, and when you're living there, you're like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then you get home, there are no texts, there are no calls, and you're calling and you're asking, hi, you're good, are we still good? Uh, yeah, we're good, I'm just busy. Okay, and it just goes. And then, of course, sometimes you always want to have closure and you just insist, like, hey, Really, we, I, I thought, you know, we had this thing going. So what happened? And they're like, okay, I just realized I am not okay with you having a kid. So, yeah. So when it comes to dating and red flags, I think I've gone through crazy ones. And I have quite a few that I look at. <laughs> and maybe when I mention someone can pick out is going on a date. And the first thing, maybe you receive a phone call. And the guy's like, oh, now you're receiving calls from men. That's, no, <laughs> already chose insecurity. Another thing is men or even women who don't feel comfortable in their own space. Like their self-esteem is just down there. So I've learned to treat myself. I'll get my salary and be like, you know what? Where are we going to sample? Which hotel are we going to sample this month? I love that. And I will take myself out. And of course, I'm a digital marketer. I'll take photos. I'll post. People will think you're very expensive. And when they want to ask you on a date, they're afraid of telling you where. You'll find someone also when you put up, maybe they asked you on a date and they told you, tell me the place where you you want me to take you? Because now they're afraid to suggest their own place. And I'm always like, you know, you are the one who knows your pockets. So you better pick out a slot. They're like, no, they insist. And then, of course, I'll pick a place I'm, I like, of course. And then they'll be like, ah, that's expensive. And it, it's a back and forth. It gets to a point I'm like, okay, this is hard. Because I believe when you want to meet someone, you'll do your research where you want to take them and you just do your own and then you're like, you know what, can I pick you on such and such a date or can we meet here on such and such a date? I love that. So most people don't have that. They're really afraid. And I think, okay, I, I, I will not blame men as much because the dating scene out here have just made men to think women are about money and that. So when they see someone who is able to do these things on themselves, first they'll think, you have a sponsor. I get that a lot. And two, uh, you're expensive. So I have to take you to a very expensive place. So if I'm to take you on a date, I have to set, you know, mm. you know do I have enough money? Am I ready? <laughs> Which is 
so wrong. I think when it comes to dating and having genuine connection, it shouldn't matter on where you go. It can be even a kibanda, it can be even in town taking kukupono and, and chips, and it's enough as long as I can have that conversation with you and I can have fun while we are doing it. Another thing is, of course, a man who wants to insist they're coming to your place, that just tells me, who he might be married. <laughs> Why are you coming to my place? <laughs> that I've found a lot. And men who come in and say, I know you have a child, and I'm not planning to have children on my own. And I think we can do this. I'm like, if you can't have the paternal feeling of having a child, how will you bond with my child? It's a little tricky when you're a single mom. You really have to look at a lot of things. And of course, you don't introduce your child to everyone every other time that you meet them. But how will you connect with my child? That's the first question, how? Um, those people who now also, again, you meet them, and because they think it's all about money, they're trying to create, an, for you to see that they have all this going on. So first thing, I remember there's a date I went, and I was like, did you Google me? I'm like, oh, OK, I was supposed to. <laughs> So I was like, do you want me to Google you? And I was like, OK, let me do that. And when I Googled, he was a temporary CEO for a company, and he wanted me to see that. I was like, this is something you would have told me. <laughs> all through the date, it was all about him. So I've built a house, I've done this, and this, and that, and that. Nothing about me. And I was just there listening, oh. Mm. So the dating scene in Nairobi is flings. Flings, flings, flings. No one wants commitment. <laughs> which is a problem. I don't know what they want. And I wonder, what, why don't people want to have, you know, the person every single day, an, an awesome person I can talk to. Nairobi is flings. So for me, doing life, juggling, being a mother, just gotten a job, being alone through and through, having lost jobs, gotten jobs, gotten awesome jobs, then lost them again. It's been a crazy th thing. And sometimes you feel bad that only bad things happen to your life. And when you're looking to, uh, like, comparing yourself to your friends and everyone else, the life is just okay. And you're wondering, okay, what did I do wrong? And so in 2019, I lost my job. I felt like life was unfair. But thankfully, I got a job in 2020, just before COVID. And now when COVID hit, now more people are losing jobs. So in the process, I was feeling the anxiety and what they're feeling. And now here, it's COVID. We don't know how long it would have taken. And that's when one day I decided, OK, I need to encourage someone out there. Mm -hmm. As much as things are tough. Because in life, we look back. We look back to the mistakes we've done, things we would have done differently. And we're always focusing on them instead of focusing on now what next, and we end up stagnating. That's why I started my podcast, but it's now just being real, good vibes only podcast, which is a simple podcast talking about everyday life and appreciating the ups and downs. That's me. A <laughs> hundred African stories, the legally clueless 2021 tour powered by African No Filter. We're traveling through Kisumu, Nakuru, Mombasa, and Nairobi, bringing you real, raw, and inspiring African stories. I really do love and appreciate just how honest and vulnerable Julia allowed herself to be when sharing this story. I also was so intrigued. I find dating to be a very interesting topic. I think because first I find it very warped. Like people think when you're in a relationship that's dating. I think is that it's it's before. So it's like the process of getting to know one another. So it has to be intentional. You have to like try and create environments where you experience things together or you have conversations. You only just get to know one another. But <laughs> After seeing Val, my best friend, she's not single now, but I think it was what, 2019, 2018 to 2019, if I'm not wrong. She was single and going on dates, etc., etc., and it was just hectic. <laughs> I'd just be like, what? <laughs> he did what? That is bananas. So I completely understood where Julia was coming from. 
and that she touched on dating while being a single mom. So in the show notes is a link to Julia's podcast. Make sure you check it out. Listen to it. It's just a really nice thing to see African podcasters thriving. So I know one of the things that's really difficult is finding African podcasts. Here I am telling you of one. Go check it out. Link is in the show notes. Okay, before we jump into anything else, sometimes I get so caught up that I forget to go through the Legally Clueless hotline number and then I find so many chats and voice notes that are just so beautiful like this one. Hi Adele. <laughs> Let me make you laugh. So it's been what? Hey, since you left radio, when when did you leave radio? Was it 2018? End of 2018? Or when? I'm not sure. I guess. I'm not sure. I don't remember quite well. So and then next thing I see, you started a podcast. And then you know what I thought about podcasts? I thought these are things for a podcast can only be found on an iPhone. So I always wondered why would people be this cruel and make eh, a podcast? Why would Adele do this to me? I've been listening to her since I, I joined Campo and then I found out found you in Kiss when you're doing the mid morning show and then you move to the morning show and then on Saturdays you used to have something Africa. What was it? What did you call it? I don't remember and I really admire you so finally I figured out so I was sitting I bought a new phone in May then I was sitting down in the house and then I, I thought I always find every app I want on my play store so let me go check if there are these podcasts so I just wrote podcast and then I found Google podcast and said let me download it and then <laughs> obviously the first thing you know is find Adele she ran away from me, so I have to find her. So I've been listening to like almost every episode now. Keep doing what you're doing. By the way, I found out I just love it. I just love it. I really love it. And I enjoy it. All the stories was in any jenga sana. Caleb, your message just like brightened my heart. And it's like going to 2 a.m. <laughs> So when I listened to it, I just felt so much energy, you know. So thank you so much for sending those kind words my way. Remember, if you check the show notes, there is the Legally Clueless hotline. If you listen to something in the podcast and it resonates with you, drop me a voice note. This is a space not only for me, but for all of us. So before I end this episode, I just want to share a couple of things. One, our next stop in the tour is Kisumu. Oh, I'm so excited. And also dreading the six-hour drive, but so excited. (laughs) And I can't wait to touch down and just meet the storytellers there and capture their stories and do so much in Kisumu. I will keep updating you in each episode on how the tour is going. Send me all the positive vibes so that everything just runs smoothly. Of course, things won't go according to plan because life But I just want it to be an enjoyable, powerful experience. You know, one of those that you remember for a very long time. So there's that. Another thing is that this podcast plays on Trace Radio. So you should listen to it there as well. And that's Trace Radio in Kenya. So head over to traceradio.co.ke for a list of frequencies throughout the country. And you can be able to listen to the podcast there and also actually stream Trace there as well. And lastly, if this is the first episode you're listening to, audio episodes go out every single Monday. And we have season one of our video series out on our YouTube channel, season two coming very soon. What else did I need to tell you? It was right here. Oh, <laughs> ah, I was forgetting like it's so important, but... It may be close to 2 a.m. and you're going to be receiving this episode in a couple of hours. So it's 2 a.m. Monday morning as I'm recording this. The only good thing about working at this hour is my neighbor's kids are nowhere to be heard. Obviously, nobody's turning on their water pumps. So I may move my production timings on Sunday. Hmm. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.